Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You're listening to ZM Global. This is Ben McLeish of the Zeitgeist Movement UK. We are but three days away from our annual Zeitgeist Day events that are taking place in around 60 countries this year around the world. Uh, Last week, we listed a few of them from Germany and from England, uh, Canada and America. This week, I wanted to draw attention to some of the other ones that are going on. We actually have two events in India. And we also have a further event in Alexandria in Egypt, site of the famous Alexandrian Public Library, which stands today having burnt down several times during its history. And I must take my hat off to them, because if you think about it, really, in a country that's actually undergoing an active rebellion, an active overthrow of its government and the power struggle that ensues any uprising, um, it is quite something to see even the slightest representation of something that must deviate from all possible cards that are listed by any of the pressure groups that are in that area at any one time. So uh, you can find their entry and the the entries that are for all of the events um, around the world for most of them will be um, March uh, the 15th, the Saturday uh, that's upcoming. Some of them will be later as well. Some of them are towards the end of March as well. But you can find all of them on zdayglobal.org. So um, this week, I've decided to interview a gentleman called Richard Osmaston, who is involved with something called the Money Free Party. Richard is an old countryman of mine. Uh, He comes from, uh, he heralds from the uh, similar area in uh, Britain to my family and moved over to New Zealand a few years ago and moved to a place that's particularly known for its uh, radical nature or its uh, slightly off the beaten path and bizarre sort of um, way of life called Nelson. Uh, Nelson has entertained the sort of more fringe elements of economics for a while. Um, and uh, is, Richard actually came to my attention through an article that was published in stuff.co.nz. That article is actually listed in the show notes for this show. Um, and it's worth checking out. It's, uh, it, it, came up, it came up because I had a Google alert for resource-based economy. If you don't know what a resource-based economy is, um, I have a very simple way of describing Uh, the underlying priority of what it is that is advocated when we talk about a resource-based economy. Because, after all, aren't all economies based on resources? That's what we think. Um, Even when we know that explicitly money is used, we tend to have this idea that resources are at the base. But consider the following. You are to imagine that you wake up tomorrow morning and all the banks in the world have declared bankruptcy at the same time. The vaults are empty. The money, which was worth nothing to begin with, is worth even less now and will not even be accepted by any shopkeeper. Um, It's not just a matter of hyperinflation. The very mechanisms for being able to buy and sell are now broken. How do you live your life from this point? What's the first thing you would have to do? Well, other than not panic, because, of course, the first thing that happens when there's even something slightly like a bank run, like we saw with Northern Rock in the UK, or as we have seen in the 1929 crash and many of the crashes before and since that plague Wall Street and are essentially there by design and cannot be forestalled against when you're using central banking. Um, As we have seen, people panic a lot when what they think is the mechanism for security uh, suddenly collapses. Well, let's presume that people are rational enough not to panic and scream and stab each other. What's the first thing they have to do? Well, everybody still does need to uh, uh, metabolize, which means they still need food, they still need air, they still need water. They will probably need transportation as well, because modern life is such that we can live in places that we wouldn't be able to live and in structures like houses that we couldn't possibly live in without some form of energy. In fact, there are some houses that you wouldn't be able to live in certain parts of were it not for the energy. For example, high-rise buildings anything above the 20th floor, and you're uh, rapidly decreasing the number of people who could possibly ever reach the top floor without breaking themselves, uh, especially over time. Of course, we would need something like lifts uh, or escalators or whatever to be able to even use the things that we have. I'm reminded of this structural limitation of the way that modern life has developed, assuming that we simply have infinite hydrocarbons and infinite energy and infinite resources, um, that, that, by the way, being the byproduct of the capitalist outlook on life, which factors in automatically by design the idea of unlimited supplies and an unlimited environment to despoil and pollute, uh, all in the name of uh, profit. It doesn't matter if this is called capitalism or anything else. That particular worldview has actually been pretty much inherent in every single version of 
uh, the economy that we've ever had. None of them have ever even bothered to try and take in a total account of what is even available locally, let alone globally, uh, to that economy. Um, I'm reminded uh, of this limitation when I go to many uh, cities, mostly in America, where it is actually impossible in certain areas to even walk because you are required to have a car. It's assumed a priori that you have a vehicle that is powered by some form of energy so that you can even go anywhere. Try Miami. You can't walk in many places in Miami without going over very, very large, very imposing, terrifying bridges that do not have sidewalks. You have to use the, the meagre public transport that Miami has, or you have to more likely have a giant gas-chugging vehicle for which the city has essentially been designed. So uh, you will obviously need some kind of transport in this new day when you wake up and suddenly there's been this vast collapse of the financial system. But what has not changed? Well, you still presumably have some kind of food. I mean, the, the systems are still there. The, the farms are still producing food. Uh, they would still be, be required to produce food, even if suddenly nobody had any money at all. You would still require shelter. On a longer or at least medium term uh, basis, you would still require education and you would require social cohesion and you would require the kind of environment that we assume and take for granted all the time. This does not change uh, when you have no money. Now, think about it the other way around. What if we woke up tomorrow and we really didn't have any energy? Well, I've already described to you some of the problems that we would have. Those problems really are problems. If we wake up tomorrow and all of our transportation globally is no longer working, a massive readaptation of life has to take place. The same kind of readaptation that we would actually not have, not really, not in a technical sense, not in terms of physical day-to-day -day living, if the entire monetary system collapsed. In fact, it's quite possible to imagine that humanity, given there is no longer the possibility of some, some sort of monetary exchange, that we would hopefully be able to bypass the idea of barter and uh, try and design an economy based on the actual resources that we have that can, that can adapt to a moneyless problem. We maintain that this thought exercise um, reveals the actual priorities of life. Uh, money is not actually important because if it vanished, we would still have the same requirements for our environment and from our environment. However, if the resources were to deplete, real disaster would ensue, an unavoidable disaster, a disaster that can't actually be avoided or mitigated by a change in behavior. Because once we run out of energy, if we run out of real supply chain economics, if our transport is inhibited, if our health is compromised, um, it doesn't matter what our outlook and our economic behavior is. We suffer immediate and devastating consequences, the kind you do not have uh, simply by factoring out money and being left with the same possible resources and the same kind of inventions that we have before. So this is what uh, we intend to talk about come Zeitgeist Day, which is our version, if you like, of the TED events, uh, technology entertainment design that have been proven themselves so popular over the years, except that we really try and push the, the, the envelope even further. It's not simply about interesting inventions anymore or particular types of studies into different kinds of education or biohacking, or whatever it is, we advocate uh, a new model, an emergent model, a model that is coming out of the capitalist system, that is a byproduct of a networked world where the wealth of the networks lies in the fact that where before wealth was measured by restriction and ownership and exclusion and property, now wealth is actually measured by openness and collaboration and availability. And uh, the true wealth is now to do with how available it is to the most people rather than uh, how unavailable it is to everybody but myself, me being the owner of a particular piece of property. This is uh, maybe an unintended consequence of the way that we have uh, invented our way uh, past uh, different uh, things over the, over the last couple of years. It could be. could be that it's an accidental consequence of the Internet and the understanding of networking and the gradual collaboration of the world in an almost anonymous way where um, interests and uh, efforts are almost coordinated by accident through end-to-end -end systems like the Internet, leading to things like uh, communal uh, gardening now, open gardens with free food, 
um, with things like uh, peer-to-peer technologies and most, most importantly things like the open source software movement, uh, which accidentally, if you like, brings together groups of concerted uh, programmers to produce incredible new um, uh, software systems and tools which can be used by anybody in any particular way. The increasing open access of academic publishing is also now bringing to the fore um, materials of scientific nature which are now available to anybody. Uh, there was a story of a teenager who recently invented a new, um, uh, a new piece of technology surrounding diabetes based on just the open access materials he could find. You'll notice that there was no planning for that. Uh, there was no effort to try and design a piece of material that would somehow make uh, diabetics' life easier. It emerges because of the inherent interest that is in humanity that it doesn't actually need to be rewarded by financial reward or anything like that. And the coming together of the available literature to inform that person uh, and to, for that to then produce innovation. Uh, Clay Shirky describes this rather well when he talks about how as a result of coordination costs, as he calls it, uh, we now have the ability to, as a byproduct, group organize in a way that would have been phenomenally expensive and very niche in the olden days. We no longer need to put out a bulletin to ask people who's got a picture of a certain festival that's happened and try and get all those collected together so that photos of that festival exist. No, no, no. Those uh, photos, those collections of photos of a particular festival, this is his example, are a natural byproduct of having something like Flickr.com. In other words, what used to plague economists back in the old days um, and still uh, openly plagues the Austrian economists now, the idea of a, uh, a need for economic calculation, for being able to work out how much of what needs to be produced, is no longer, in fact, a relevant economic question. The kind of production, the kind of demand gauging that we now have when it comes to gradually energy as we start harvesting that individually uh, in, in uh, on various parts of our uh, buildings and landscape, the Internet of Things, which is now emerging, which is you know smart meters, smart um, sofas, <laughs> smart beds, smart fridges, and all the rest of it, the gradual um, group developments of everything mean that the kind of products that we end up with are automatically generated as a byproduct of being able to work together. They don't need to be quantified in advance. Demand doesn't need to be judged by price. It needs to be simply allowed to come to the fore, to be able to win out uh, over the other ideas in a natural way without actually having to make a conscious decision. Actually, I'll put it the following way, because uh, the demands of us to explain how we would do economic calculation in what we now call a resource-based economy does in fact come from a form of central planning, something that, ironically, the Austrian economists and many others claim is a danger uh, and claim is a, an awful thing. Well, I put it back to you, uh, dear eco economist, if you are listening, that the idea of using price to judge anything is, in fact, to demand a central mechanism, a central planning for the economy, to demand in advance that we know what to produce and we need to work out the price for it so we know how much to produce. The model we are advocating, the model, actually, that is coming about anyway, uh, is one where this is actually not something that's consciously required anymore, just like we don't need to judge how many megabytes of information will go up and downstream on the Internet today. It's all a matter of the system being able to be as elastic as possible in all directions and nodal and end-to-end -end and peer-to-peer -peer that allows the load balancing to occur without uh, bean counters having to be sitting somewhere in the economy trying to judge it. That's a long-form way of describing the more economic side of the resource-based economy. If you're more interested in uh, this kind of stuff, please do join us uh, this weekend and in the next couple of weekends in certain parts of the world for our Zeitgeist Day, which, uh, which is, in many cases, uh, viewings of films, uh, in many other cases, lectures like the ones in London, Toronto, um, and the ones in San Diego, for example. Some of them take the form of very similar things to science fairs, like uh, Z-Day Los Angeles this year, which actually have no direct talks, It'll be a sort of symposium where people come together and look at different stalls and different um, models and things like that. Um, so get a better idea of what we're talking about by looking at that. Now I'll move on to my interview with Richard Osmerston, who uh, is coming at the resource-based angle 
through the traditional uh, mechanism of politics to try and spread awareness about what we mean and what we demand of our future, the move away from opinion and from uh, you know, voting for particular people, ironically, by trying to be voted for and putting the resource-based economy talking point at least on a ballot so it can receive some kind of exposure. Uh, Richard goes into some detail about how he essentially puts it to the uh, political establishment in New Zealand that they simply aren't good enough anymore and that uh, growing an economy no longer suffices and is in fact an extremely dangerous thing. So my uh, interview with him is about an hour long. About halfway through we suffer a slight um, uh, communications problem and I had to call him back from uh, Skype via his phone. So you'll notice there's a slight change in tone, but it's clear enough to understand. Uh, but just know that there is an edit halfway through that you'll probably notice, but uh, it shouldn't bother you too much. And here is my interview with Richard. I come to this fairly green, so I don't know too much about yourself or about what is going on in New Zealand. So why don't you tell myself and the listeners who you are and how you came to be in New Zealand? Yeah, okay, Ben. Thanks. I grew up in the UK, actually, on a farm in West Sussex, and uh, my family were very active politically and socially and very socially aware, and we spent a lot of time as children marching um, for CND marches in London, <coughs> campaign for nuclear disarmament, and we camped at Greenham Common as little children in the 60s protesting against nuclear uh, American bombers being based there. And so this has been a sort of lifelong thing. I'm 50 now. But uh, I left the farm when I was a young man and went into aircraft engineering and then I became an airline pilot. And uh, eventually we moved out to New Zealand anyway after 9-11, really because the whole flavour of the UK and Europe had changed so much. And especially in the airline industry, it was just a ghastly place to work, really. And we were totally disillusioned with aviation and what they call security and this apparent, inverted commas, threat from terrorists just ruining our, our lives, basically. So we thought, well, we could make a better life in New Zealand. And so we came out here in 2003. And, of course, financially, it worked out extremely well for us back in those days. It's not the same now. But uh, the exchange rate was very favourable. Land and things were very cheap here. And so we were in a position to retire at age 40, which was just, the, you know, an unheard of privilege, really. And it presented me personally with a fantastic opportunity to pursue something completely different to other than, you know, lining my own pockets, basically, which is what most of us do, you know, if, uh, if there's any to spare. And then I got involved um, in, I mean, there's all kinds of activism going on down here, and I think New Zealand's quite well known for its uh, <laughs> environmental image, I'll say with caution. But uh, there's a lot of very caring people down here. They're very connected to each other. And uh, in some ways, it's the leading edge kind of place, which I was surprised to find, actually. In, in many ways, it's quite backward, but conversely, in other ways, it's very forward, um, particularly in sort of environmental, social awareness type areas. And uh, we found it very refreshing, very invigorating environment. And, uh, and of course, you know, in my mid-40s, I mean, most people are working flat out then, but I was in a position to study some things a bit more deeply and follow my passion really which is sort of social equality and environmentalism and I've had a lot of jigsaw pieces if you like floating around in my psyche they've been there my whole life things that just didn't fit and I couldn't put them together very frustrating and I of course having here moved here and retired a lot of time to think about it and to research it the advent of the internet changed all that kind of thing and then I stumbled across the first Zeitgeist movie, which was just a massive breath of fresh air. And then I realized that there was a lot of other people in the rest of the world feeling exactly the same way. And uh, I think this is probably 2007 or 8 we're talking now. So, yeah, maybe even earlier, actually. Um, and the whole thing started to come together. And then, again, with time and energy and enthusiasm to look at this more closely, we've just further refined the fact that the money system itself is basically the cause of every single one of our problems. Does that make sense, Ben? Yes, that does make sense. And uh, it, I'm sure for many people who are listening, it's probably a familiar path as well. It's um, that people seem to know that there's something wrong, whether they have been 
uh, active or not in, in, in political or social issues, or whether they have always had that sneaking suspicion that while they are not involved, something very much amiss, something misaligned, the wrong kind of focus is being led. And I think that's, that's certainly true of me. That's certainly, I was very inactive before I came to any of this. So, okay, so it was with you. It was, um, wow, you got to retire at 40, man. That is brilliant. <laughs> that is like seven years away from me, and I'm nowhere near that. Um, but listen, I, I wanted to ask you, um, tell me about the Money Free Party. What is that? Yes, Ben, the Money Free Party, that's the very latest incarnation of our course of action down here. And I'm going to be a bit sort of conceited here, but I'd like to say one of the reasons I think I've been so successful so far in promoting the resource-based economic cause is, <laughs> excuse me, is because I'm such a flaky lightweight. And by that, I mean... Because I don't, A, have a job, I mean, I actually run a farm and, you know, I do a lot of voluntary work, all kinds of things. I'm, of course, very busy. I mean, who isn't when they're 50? But I don't actually have, I'm not beholden to anybody else and I can choose what I do with every day, basically. And it means that I'm free to move as best befits that day. And in 2014, it makes sense that actually the plan you had a month ago or a week ago even may well already be out of date because times are changing so quickly that the plan we had when we were 40 or when we were 30 or whatever, well, <laughs> that's all been completely superseded by modern knowledge, modern technology, global understanding, etc. And in fact, forget it. That is pointless. And for somebody like me, I'm really happy to have got the best sort of bang for my buck out of a particular project and as soon as I see a better one then I'll drop it and skip to the next one and in some ways I mean in, in our parents and previous generations got anyway like that because you needed resilience and hard work and you'd have to have a five and a ten year plan but today things are changing so fast that you know, who knows what's going to happen I mean never mind next year we don't know what's going to happen next month or next week so I started out wondering what on earth am I going to do with this understanding that I quite quickly sort of fleshed out and realized, wow, this is, this is massive, this money thing. This is just enormous. And with time, you get to realize this could solve every single problem that we know. And thus, it's probably the most important thing that has ever happened and I realize that's a very bold statement but I've been saying that in big public groups for a long time and nobody can really challenge it with any decent sort of authority this is so important that it's worth pursuing how to pursue it has been forgive me the difficult question and so we started out you know over five years ago with conventional protest handing out leaflets we took part in the Occupy movement. We handed out leaflets then. We harangued people in the street. We had little meetings. You know, I started a little web site that, you know, died an early death. And conventional means of putting out an important message. And quite quickly, I realized that, well, everybody's got their little protest today, hasn't it? Whether they love whales or this seagull or that possum or that tree. They hate mining or oil or nuclear. Oh, crikey. And of course, with the plethora of communication tools today, we are utterly swamped with new important messages, many of them corrupted anyway. But even so, even the good ones are just buried in all that sort of monstrous volume of information. You, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. And so I realized that conventional protest conventional activism, etc., isn't going to get you anywhere, son. And as I've witnessed with my own family, you know, we did all that protesting in the 60s and 70s, and it didn't make any difference, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I couldn't really understand why. And, of course, I mean, I've made a video about this, which you can see on my Facebook page, Resource-Based Economy, amongst others. There's lots of others out there. Conventional protest and activism are really over now. Because at the end of the day, on the other side, you've got people who are desperate. 
And it's not that the head of Monsanto or Shell is a monster. It's just that at the bottom of the sort of pyramid of those organizations, those institutions, are poor, desperate people. And whilst you might, if you're lucky, you might have 10 years of good sort of activism and protest energy in you, if you're lucky, before you just get worn down by, oh, crikey, you know, it's just, I mean, it's tough out there, I know. Whereas there's still another billion poverty-stricken people who would give anything to have a job, you know, on the fringes of Monsanto, GM, I mean, it doesn't matter. Any of these industries, they provide what people need at the bottom and uh, they'll do anything to get it. And so it was all sort of pointless, conventional protest. Anyway, the point I'm coming to, Ben, so I had to look for different means of getting this information out there. And I found that really face-to-face, -face, because we're dealing with, really with brainwashing, face-to-face -face was the only way to do it. And I mean, you can get, with time, you get better at it. And of course, every time you talk about it, it gets more refined, it gets more simple. Um, I have a lot of foreign people coming to stay with me here in Nelson in New Zealand. And I'm frequently having to explain resource-based economics to people um, in other languages, and that really forces you, literally, to make it simple, to make it understandable. And I think that's really vital as you sort of mature the concept. And uh, does this make sense so far, Ben? I'll hand you over. Yes, it, it partly does, although it brings about something I wanted to ask you about um, or seek your advice on. Uh, you say that traditional protest is dead, and I, I agree almost completely with you. Um, however, I'm not completely sold on purely face-to-face. -face. Obviously, uh, with face-to-face, -face, it allows us to read each other in ways that's just not possible in print. But I still think there's a place for pamphleteering, for the writing of books and the producing of things like films or, or short videos. But one thing that came out recently in the, um, in the blogosphere was the uh, efforts by the JTRIG within the GCHQ um, secret service listening stations of the UK, that they were spending a phenomenal amount of money on um, combating cyber activism. Um, people always call cyber activists um, slacktivists. They say it's not enough, you know, you're just sitting at home on Facebook all day, you're not doing enough. Um, but then if that were true, and if it was so ineffectual, then I don't think our government would be spending so much time on being able to control false narratives online and to silence, discredit, or otherwise insult or embarrass those people who do speak out in that medium. But I don't think you're, you're particularly shouting against that. I just think that there is definitely a place for it. But the, the question I wanted to ask you was, what kind of resistance have you faced so far with um, with dealing with people there. I mean, obviously, I'm not talking about the way that individual people um, uh, receive your ideas, but have you have you found it tricky to fund your um, um, to, to fund your projects for sort of a p political activism? And have you found that people have spent any significant amount of time or money trying to discredit or misrepresent your political um, uh, attempts, like we see in the mainstream? political parties all the time. We see these people smear each other, even though they're essentially all different wings of the same business party. And we see, you know, independents being, you know, like private lives being leaked and things like that. Have you found that it's been a lot more soft where you've been? Or have you managed to deal with this quite well? Or have you not received any of this at all? That's a good question, Ben. Have we encountered much opposition towards the... Uh introduction of resource-based economics? And the answer, I would say, in Nelson, New Zealand, is actually no. Um, online, we get a pretty good hammering online from sort of troll-type people. But, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I did wonder, when I was trying to ring you a few months ago, I just continually could, could not get through on the telephone for one reason or another. One does wonder what the uh, SIS and GCHQ are cooking up between them. But... Uh, <laughs> No, very little actual physical resistance. And as I've discovered, because I'm not a uh, intellectual really, and I didn't go to university, I didn't study economics or anything, I have very sort of unconventional approaches to things, and I tend to do them all wrong to start with. And because I don't really, or I didn't really know, wow, what am I going to do with this? I certainly wasn't going to go into a dark office in Wellington and write a long book. Um, which is what generally happens with, you know, experts in their intellectual field. 
I took it to the street, and Nelson's a funny little place. We're very remote. I mean, there's 80,000 people here in the city and in the region, and most of them actually know each other. <laughs> so there's a very strange sort of connectivity that one probably doesn't find with respect in Leeds or Brighton or London, because there's just a lot less people here, and they are generally connected, not by six degrees, but more often than not two or at the most three degrees of separation. It's quite uncanny. It's amazing, and so there is this connection. And as the argument has got more, I was going to say sophisticated, but actually I would say as the con as the argument has got more refined and more focused, and you know, every time you talk about something. You get better at explaining it, I think. You know, it's just practice. It's like playing a musical instrument. As that gets more focused, it becomes clearer why and who is likely to be opposed to it. And what I've been doing physically on the street, most of the time people actually get it themselves. They say, well, yeah, okay, all right, Richard, I understand that. That's great. And yeah, I'd love it to happen in my environment, but you'll never get so-and-so to do it. And so I actually sort of nail them down and say, well, hang on, who do you actually mean, so-and-so? And they say, oh, well, those business people, those bankers, you know. So <laughs> what I've done, I've gone to the business people, business owners and operators, people working in finance, people working in banking, and said, look, do you understand what we're on about here with this resource-based economics? Because what we've seen so far is it's sort of a, and in fact, I think you could say this historically of basically every protest movement throughout history, pre-abundance, the, the protesters have always been basically saying, we want to take from them, and someone's going to lose it out. And the difference with the moneyless economy, with the resource-based economy, is that nobody loses. It is absolutely win-win, and I'm really hard on this point. If you really look closely at your personal circumstances, Mr. Investment Banker, uh, super yacht owner, pop star, head of Monsanto, hippie, you know, lorry driver, it doesn't matter. Whoever you are, if you really look closely, and this is where the eye to eye thing, and I agree it's not essential, Ben, but the eye, this is where the eye to eye thing has got me through. When you really talk to people, everybody's in the shit. Excuse my French. It, I mean, my favorite expression today is that even the rich are poor. You know, my son's been working on super yachts in the eastern Mediterranean all the last summer. And, I mean, yeah, that's great. And these people have got business jets and two super yachts and everything you could ever want, dripping with diamonds and so on. When you really get to know these people, at the end of the day, they're just people just like us, underneath all the glitz and the suits and the security guards and the sunglasses. They're just people, and when you really talk to them, they're really worried too. I mean, who isn't aware of global climate issues? Um, we don't even need to talk about whether it's real or not. It doesn't matter. Who isn't aware of that today? Who isn't aware of the problems of social inequality? Who isn't aware of the fact that pollution you know, isn't really great? And the fact that, yeah, you might have everything, but if your neighbor has nothing, well, where's your daughter going to go out when she goes out in the evening? Who's your son going to be associating with? Why does your wife have to take these ghastly tablets all the time and have another boob job and get her hair done again and having cosmetic surgery? Why am I so stressed about the business? Can I trust this new manager? You know, everyone has got problems today, and really, even the rich, they've just got more expensive problems than the poor. I mean, I'd still rather be rich than poor, don't get me wrong, but this is changing and everybody has got really serious concerns. Everybody, but you have to get through to them on a human level. And in New Zealand, in Nelson especially, you can get through. I mean, I get a politician that's a sitting MP today if I want to. I mean, I know where these people live. We do sports together, that kind of thing. Everybody's accessible. You don't have this massive sort of societal divide. And I remember very much in the UK, I mean, I lived there for 40 years, and I never, ever actually saw a politician. <laughs> so I hope that answers the question, Ben. Um, over to you. You raise a very interesting point. Um, do you, I mean, I'll, I'll ask several questions and then I'll come back to you, but it seems to me that the stronger the local community, the easier it is to um, pitch something that relies on human connectivity and locality and understanding your um, your regional um, 
uh, culture, I suppose. And as we've become moved to cities and we've, we've gradually become atomized and isolated and dislocated, um, even though, ironically, at the same time being crammed into ever tighter and tighter spaces so that we are not actually alone, but we may feel more lonely. Uh, I can see that that immediately invites the idea of reverse engineering that and saying, listen, the whole underlying basis of society really needs to be cooperative and interconnected. That must strike people as very alien when they live the city life. Um, so that's my first point, and maybe you can think about that. Um, I also had a, a colleague, a former colleague of mine, is from New Zealand as well, and when he, when I brought up to him what I'm about to ask you about in the broader sense, which is the sort of the, the sort of political victories you've had over there, when I said, "Look, what's this place Nelson like?" He said, "Oh, it's always at the forefront, man. It's always alternative and crazy and money free and resource based. It's like it's been like that anyway. This this guy knows what I do in my spare time when I'm not working." And, and he pitched it like as the kind of place that would adopt that kind of thing and, and actually operate partly on the, on, on the basic understanding that this, this kind of goes straight for the resources, don't deal with banking, you know, get to what actually matters and what really does serve people is, is so readily adopted there. But why not tell me and the listeners about some of your past victories and maybe some of your present battles in the political arena? Because it should be noted you have made the headlines. And it's only because of the weird sphere of influence that we have in what we call the West um, that these go um, less noticed than they should do. Because really, uh, having having uh, anybody deal with politics on a deliberately and openly money-free platform should would make the news overnight tomorrow if that was a success in the UK. So tell me what has been achieved so far and where you're still laboring away. Yeah, that's good, Ben. I'll, I'll go to the, the, the last thing first, if I may. The, uh, I suppose going back to that connectivity thing, I mean, Nelson is a funny place. It's not really all hippies. It was a while ago, but it's become very industrialized now, very tourist industry focused. There's a lot of wine industry, dairy, um, logging. Um, it's quite a lot of craft industries, but many of them have become pretty commercialized, to be honest with you. And it's, uh, I mean, it's like everywhere in the world. It's become, you know, a, just a different, slightly more subtle way of emptying your pockets for you. But uh, the people are very connected, and one of the unusual things about Nelson is that the majority of the population actually choose to live here. Um, they weren't just born here and happened to be here because they got a job or something. A lot of people are really quite idealistic and you know, have come from all over the world to be here, and that does make a difference, which was the first point, wasn't it? Yeah, the, the second point, um, wondering what to do with this newfound knowledge of mine. As I say, I spent a lot of time blogging, which didn't really get me very far. The website never really got off the ground. And then um, I managed to make a few presentations at schools in the area, which went down really well. I mean, kids just get resource-based economics, as you know, as a teacher, then straight away. I mean, because it's just so blooming obvious. <laughs> And so I had a really great run with that, and that drew a lot of good publicity in the region. Um, got me into the local newspaper, the Nelson Mail, which although is a Fairfax, you know, which is a huge media conglomerate down here, although it's a Fairfax paper, they still have some really decent, like you know, proper journalists here who actually occasionally get to write something worthwhile. And so I got some really great mileage out of that. And they're always looking for interesting, sort of colourful characters in the region. Um, and that got a lot of good publicity, I mean, in some ways, throughout the Fairfax network. So that was good. And then um, we have some various festivals and events that go on here fairly regularly, and I made some uh, presentations at exhibitions and things like EcoFest is quite a big one for us down here. And we have a festival up at the Lake where I live, um, which also got quite a good reception. And then... Um, both our local councils, Tasman District Council and Nelson City Council, have sort of open forums. One's a five, the other's a ten minute presentation to the full council and the mayor about what we would like as a population included in the long term plan. And it seemed to me, well, why not just have a crack at it? You know, what's the worst that can happen? And again, of course, you know, being a little place, the councillors, the mayors, etc. They're people that we know. They're people that our children go to the same schools as their children. We sit on the same committees together. You know, they're not sort of anonymous officials. And, you know, again, 
practice it, Richard. You've got to practice this material out there in public, make a fool of yourself to refine it. And I found myself writing a presentation to make to both these councils. And one literally stands there and I tell them a bit about resource base for the economics and I can now look at these people in the eye and say, you know that what you're doing is no longer good enough, don't you? And these, I mean, these are the people that are running our region and nobody shakes their head anymore because even the top officials, they know that increasing our sales of wine overseas or increasing dairy production in the region, that's not going to solve anything. We have massive civic debt here. The council debts are in tens, hundreds in some cases of billions of dollars. They know they can't increase business act activity to pay this off. They can't push the rates up anymore. The little old biddies and things, they just cannot afford it. They know they're in a lot of trouble. And so it puts me in a wonderful position to say to these people, you know, Richard, Aldo, with the previous mayors, this is no longer good enough, don't you? And, okay, Richard, thank you very much for that. You know, <laughs> amazing. And so basically, I'm back to your original question. No, no hard opposition because it's so obvious, Ben, as you know yourself. This is just, you know, this isn't just new idea. This is how it should have been, you know. And it just takes time to get people to take that seriously. Shortly after, well, this, we're talking two years, three years ago now, Gradually, the process, again, refinement, what are we going to do? Next thing was the local elections. And it seemed to me so obvious. Why not stand as mayor for Nelson City on a resource-based economy ticket? Nothing else. The council staff, they know how to run the city. They can sort out the drains and the traffic and the welfare and things. The mayor should be a figurehead, someone who's got a head you know, at the front, leading as an example with some sort of vision. And, I mean, I've got any money, so I can't afford any advertising, but the mileage I got from the mayoral campaign was absolutely staggering. And, uh, I mean, I only got 350 votes at the end, and the winning mayor got 7,500, but I wasn't ever expecting to win. And in some ways, you know, thank goodness I didn't, because I'd be bogged down with earthquake risk and traffic and all the other problems that mayors have to put up with, whereas really there's much more important work to do um, promoting a resource-based economy. <laughs> and so that's led us on now. That was back in November last year. Um, I managed to get onto national television twice. There's a TV program called The Nation, which is screened on weekends. And uh, a TV crew came, flew down from Auckland to interview me on my, uh, in, in Nelson. And uh, that was amazing and got a really great reception from then. Again, a visionary TV producer who wanted, you know, something a bit different and was interested. You know, young guy, young family. And he knows, you know, the old ways aren't going <laughs> to, they're no longer working. So that was really a phenomenal success. And I got a huge amount of mileage out of the whole mayoralty campaign program. Um, never spending money, never putting up ghastly pictures of my blooming boat race on the side of the road, which everyone else does, a huge expense and pathetic. But nevertheless, resource-based economics was there on the voting documents that went through every single household letterbox, and that was just amazing. And of course, I mean, the other day we were in Trafalgar Street in Nelson, and a total stranger comes up to me, well done, Richard, good luck in the election, mate. You know, I mean, and that is so fantastic when that happens. You know, and this wasn't a, some hippie covered in tattoos, nothing wrong with that, I've got my head. <laughs> but this is just an ordinary business person out for a drink on a Friday night, you know, and that, to get that sort of reception is just so uh, buoying, you know, it just makes me so excited, it's fantastic. So after the mayoral campaign, I then had quite a long program of other presentations per, uh, talking about resource-based economics in theatres and cafes, presentations at uh, a festival up here that we had at the lake. Again, same festival, but a different presentation format. Went down really well. And then that sort of stopped momentarily. And I've been considering in the back of my mind, are we going to have a crack at the general election in November and we decided about a month ago, well, what else are you going to do? <laughs> and when you've got all these clowns up there on stage, on television, in the paper, spouting their usual rubbish about increasing economic growth and green jobs and, you know, the minimum wage, oh, we're going to get fourteen twenty-five an hour now. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. You know, when the cost of living is sixteen twenty-five an hour, <laughs> etc. Um 
I just realized we've got to be there. We absolutely have to be there. And in my in my engineering aircraft career of 25 years, an awful lot of it is about procedure, documentation, bureaucracy. I mean, you know, it's paperwork that keeps those planes in the sky. And I'm used to trawling through mountains of ghastly manuals and procedures. And in fact, as I spent a bit of time researching registering a new political party, actually that's all it is. We do need 500 signatures from eligible New Zealanders, but other than that, it's just a stupid paperwork legwork exercise, and I've got the time to do it. And uh, so that's what we're doing. Yeah, over to you, Ben. It's so refreshing to hear that all the ballots that went through those homes have resource-based economy on them. I think I would struggle to find anybody in our movement, no matter what their disposition towards engaging the political system is about what is essentially our fairly apolitical effort, that that isn't a good thing. Uh, and that they, they must glow quietly inside with the fact that one tiny element of the system was bent in shape so that uh, this could be enunciated. I think sometimes just having that option um, helps so, so hugely. And uh, that's actually how I found out about you. Um, nobody sent me any of your stuff. Um, I have various Google alerts set up, and it was an article from stuff.co.nz that relayed your story to me automatically, um, which I think is a big deal and is something that anybody should be pleased about. Um, we've obviously, I say we, um, one of the people who was involved with uh, TZM and, and the Venus Project, a guy called Scott Keller, who I've mentioned a few times. I, I mention him almost every time that we mention anything to do with engaging the political system because his, his effort was so futile whilst, of course, being so noble. Uh, he tried to run for president of the United States of America, which, uh, you know, is a brilliant effort. And, and of course, he knew and said multiple times that he knew he wouldn't win, like it's not going to happen. Uh, not with all of the money and resistance and all the preconceptions that the voting public have. He did it for awareness. He did it so that he could, he could get a platform uh, that was something other than our films, our websites, uh, maybe our scant media appearances, which have grown much more common since then. Because that was, what, 2012, it would have been. Um, and he, he used it purely to be able to get that. I mean, it, the same effort is done sometimes by Neil Kiernan of VTV and V Radio, who tries to get a resource-based economy on the caucus in, in Michigan so that it can at least be listed in some of the uh, material and can actually be discussed uh, at these events. So I think that's great. What advice would you give to anybody who is thinking about engaging local politics, what, or what works, what might not, what is worth, you know, any particular kind of tactic? What do you think? Okay, well, firstly, in a sort of holistic way, you've got to get your material good. It's so easy, and I mean, in some ways, <laughs> there's no other way of doing it. You've got to go out there on a relatively small platform and make a fool of yourself. You know, it does take a bit of a shove in, you know, sort of emotionally to go up to someone and say, hello, I'm completely mad, you know, <laughs> which is what they think you're saying. And that's kind of scary. I mean, because of my background, I've done that all my life. You know, I don't even care. And the people that love me, I trust. And, you know, you know, those that matter don't mind and those that mind don't matter kind of thing. But, you know, that's I, I realize that's not so easy for everybody. But the only way to refine the material and have confidence in it is to go out and practice it and you'll get smashed around you know and i i mean you know i've had years of walking away from conversations thinking well you looked a right idiot there didn't you and again you know and you walk away in the early days with doubt you're thinking that bloody ben mcleish and all those tzm lot they're nutters what are you doing what did you just say that to someone you know but of course you know you so say you go away and lick your wounds for a bit and then you realize, actually, bollocks, they, I was right. I, I should have, oh, why didn't I say that? You know, it's just a process of learning. It's like playing a musical instrument, which I'm learning to do. And, you know, to begin with, you sound rubbish, you know. <laughs> but if you don't blow it, you'll never make any music at all. And so you've got to go out there, talk to your friends about it, talk to your family about it. And, I mean, I was doing that last night. We had five people here for dinner, <clears throat> all of them totally convinced I'm completely mad. But after three hours of it, wow, they don't have to go quiet. Amazing. And that's the time to back off. I mean, that's sort of moving on. That's another sort of piece of advice I'd say is don't 
hammer people into the ground. When you get a bit of mileage, you know, if you can quit while you're ahead, and of course people love to think of things themselves rather than having been told something by some smart ass, it's so much better. So if you can get a little bit of progress with somebody, if you can bear to do it, back off. You know, they started, they said the RBE words, they've got a bit of a gist of it, maybe leave them with a question or two, but don't try and win them over 100% the first time because it's too much, you know, we've, we, we're deeply damaged, you know, and it takes a long time to heal. You have to be very patient. And that's, you know, going back to the reading people's faces kind of thing. You know, personally, you can actually see when someone's had enough, you know. <laughs> Whereas on paper or online or whatever, it's very difficult to judge how far to push it on the first, you know, or the second occasion or whatever. Um, as to what to actually do, yeah, I mean, engage with people, talk to people about it, especially young people who are so refreshing. And, I mean, you will come across people who they ain't never going to do this. Never. And don't waste your breath because right next door is someone who loves it, you know, and it's so much more invigorating and it makes you feel so great when somebody gives you a positive response compared to spending half an hour, you know, getting shouted at and basically arguing with someone who's utterly dug their heels in, you know, that's completely pointless. Yeah, you know, does I, that make sense, Ben? Like that. Yeah, it's true. There's a, one, I'll show you two, two of my favorite stories, none of which have to do with politics, but... It, it gives you an idea of when, when you absolutely have to cut off. The first one is Matt Berkowitz, who runs the Vancouver chapter of the Zyko. Yes. Yep. You know him. He's, very, he's, very, he's fairly well known in our movement. And he, um, he was having a conversation with someone about um, the, uh, essentially the way uh, human beings are affected by their environment. Yep. And he was trying to make the case that this is basically on their stall that they have in Vancouver, like every Saturday, he, the stall. Yeah. Is that next to their, their, their tool library? Uh, no, that's ah, that's Toronto. That's Ryan Diamond in the Toronto Tool Library. I so, beg your pardon, you're right. It is, yes, yes, yep. What they man, Canada in all its forms, really shooting ahead, like you guys, just shooting ahead, man. <laughs> so, <Take over. laughs> yeah, he, was, he was talking to this person. He was trying to say, look, you know, there's no such thing as things like free will in the way that we understand it, right? There's actually there's a multitude of inputs, and there's you know societal conditioning, and there's the damage that structural violence does to the way that people see the world. And this person was having none of it. So in the end, Matt said, aren't you saying that there is nothing that affects how a person would actually make their decisions? That there's no environmental input. <laughs> so, no environmental input. He said, all right, we're done. See you later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, best just walk away. Yeah, amazing. So, use that language. Then why are you even talking to this person? And the second... <laughs> The second one was, oh, yes, um, in fact, another stall in London. And somebody was talking, they come from a particularly Muslim um, a viewpoint. And I believe one of our guys was trying to make the case that, you know, look, look, you know, you can believe all you want, man. But, like, people are getting massacred out there just for their beliefs and for the profit and gain of the Western war machine, man. And, like, yeah. believing stuff isn't going to do anything. Like, you know, <laughs> what people really need and, and you know, changes people's minds. And this person basically put the following viewpoint forward. They said, well, actually, um, all those people that have been massacred were helped because they have now gone to heaven earlier. Than <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So, like, and, I mean, if I had been there, I would have said, all right, well, you presumably support murdering every Muslim then. Yeah. Right? Bring your children here. Yeah. I mean, wow. I mean, but of course, if you put it that way, they go, no, that would be terrible. Go, all right. So what are we talking about? <laughs> At that point, they just said, all right, man, see you later. Thanks. That's a great viewpoint you got there. Hope it works out for you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not yeah. religion. that's particular to religion. You know, this is very bizarre. Uh, sort of, it sort of trumps all human needs and all the rest of it. So, yeah, sometimes yeah. there are times where you, unfortunately, there are people alive now who will never buy into this. And yes, absolutely. Yeah. Navigate around them. In, uh, yeah. In, Way. Yeah, I agree. But I don't think there are very many. And I think from our point of view, particularly from a talking to other people point of view, it, I, I have to remind myself of this constantly, you know, because of course I'm all enthusiastic and excited about it, especially, especially once I get sort of wound up, is don't go for conversions. I hate using these bloody rugby analogies, but don't don't go all the way today. Just be happy to get a few yards with each one and then move along to someone else and bring them forward a few yards. Because every, every other indication around us 
is basically backing up our story. And sometimes I actually wonder if, I mean, it feels like in the Nelson region that resource-based economics has sufficient uh, stature, shall we say, that in time it will be the only thing left. <laughs> you know, everything else is so happily discrediting itself that moneyless will be the only thing left standing because nothing else stands up to scrutiny. And I found this, especially on stage when we were doing the mayoral campaigning, where quite often there was the four of us mayor candidates on the stage. I mean, on one occasion, 450 people in the audience asking questions. And I realized, you know, starting out on this sort of month of campaigning, I, I felt I was sort of the you know, <laughs> the nutter in the background, you know, with a jester hat and the funny makeup. But in fact, I was the only people, that, the only person that people believed. And I didn't realize how that would come out in my persona and in my body language and in my enthusiasm. Because when you do believe in something, you know, to your very core, you can't hide it. And of course, the other candidates, I mean, they're fabulous people, don't get me wrong. They're passionate about their community. They're extremely hardworking, very professional, all that stuff. But they don't believe that economic growth is going to save us. They don't believe that riparian planting is going to stop river pollution. I mean, you know, <laughs> how long can you keep this pretense up? You know, of course, they don't know what else to do, but it's falling by the wayside on its own. You know, it's almost like RBE is an inevitability if we don't sort of have a you know a massive punch up on the way to you know to that point which i mean here in nelson i think we'll get there before we start fighting but uh, i appreciate in leeds and london you've probably got a slightly different shaped battle anyway yeah does that make sense no oh, it certainly does sir. um it, i've not been able to really gauge the the, the leeds thinking on this if one could even generalize it that way but there are some interesting um uh, passions that play uh, here i mean one of them is that <clears throat> almost still within living memory uh there is the victorian age of uh textile production and yep. the uh, conversion uh, by machines away from all of that um yes. felt and i mean obviously these days of course leads has utterly reinvented itself years ago um yep. still a very thriving and very interesting place but I think people have sort of forgotten this. There is a sort of a, a negative tendency towards um, these ideas in general, I suppose. There, there is almost an overtone, especially up north, of the, this being utopianism. Um, yeah. I think the reason that that manifests itself has nothing to do with the, with the abilities of any particular northerner, but it's the, it's, the, it's the very harshly felt broken promises of previous yes. governments. Yeah particularly hit up here, and it particularly yep. hit primary industry and actual life. Yep. Yep. You know, the, the, the effects weren't just monetary, they were technical. Yeah. And I think people yeah. have a, a well-deserved and well-justified fear of talking about that kind of stuff. But I think it's changing, and I, I certainly don't want to generalize and say that anybody from the North would think that. It's just no. that in the past, they shut off very, very quickly and tend to be very, very practical, very ultra re here and now practical. But it's changing. I mean, there is a tool library in Leeds, for example. Um, is there? Wow. You with them yeah. as well. So I, I must say that there are other sides to this. Um, but and it's interesting what, what it just made me think of. I think so many people these days totally expect every would-be politician to have their hand in the fucking pot. That when yes. they and say, we're against money, we, we actually want to... <laughs> we, we want no? to <laughs> automatically get people to go, oh, well, he's definitely not in it for the money then. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A, a thing that helps along this almost natural selection of the various political slants, like you say, yeah. man. With the, the the RBE model is equipped for real life, and that's why it'll adapt to the environment. And everything else will yeah. will actually not just collapse, but you know has a worrying tendency to actually destroy the environment that it's yeah. adapting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's so many things we could talk about, Ben. There's something I re I'm really excited about at the moment, and I mean going back to your, you know, the the, the Oh, the outlook of, you know, ordinary <laughs> working class northerners, I suppose. You know, the music of Alan Price and people like that, I'm thinking, <laughs> that I grew up with, actually. I mean, we certainly weren't part of that struggle, but uh, we were very aware of it. Um, and what I think I've managed to do, or I'm in the process of doing here in Nelson, is specifically tailoring my approach to the people that I'm associated with. 
because everybody is slightly different. We've all been brainwashed in a slightly different way. And to you just have to somehow tap into that person's particular customized brainwash to figure out how to help them out of it. And I liken it to sort of my, my, my daughter does uh, natural horsemanship. And it's all about opening the door. It's not leading you out. It's showing you that you personally have the potential to see your way out of this. It's not I'm going to show you what to do. It's I'm showing you what the possibilities are. And it's sort of subtly different. And, and what, one of the things that really excites me about the transition process, which you probably don't want to go into too deeply on this occasion because it's such a massive subject, and this is real sort of breaking stuff right now, is that I think that the transition process itself will be ultimately, and I'm talking, I mean, in a really short time frame, I absolutely will not say years or generations, don't get me started on that, no way, we're talking weeks or months. The transition process itself will be ultimately given that final shove by the business community. And of course, traditionally, you know, people of our ilk have sort of vilified business. And I mean, I've even got a sticker on beside my bed that says, Business is war, you know. <laughs> I've given these out in the street. And of course, conventionally, money based business is war. But in a resource based economy, we still will have transactions between people, but they'll be of a different flavor. And what the point I'm getting at is that, with the greatest respect to the, how should you say, the woodland folk, <laughs> the hippies and things, on the whole, they never really did anything. They did a lot of thinking and a lot of loving, and I mean, I am one of them, I'm not knocking them at all, but they weren't the proactive people who actually went out and did digging and sawing and selling and production. You know, that was left to, at the end of the day, the energetic, the ruthless, the cunning, the powerful, the motivated, the intelligent, and so on. And those particular traits have now dominated everything. And of course, that's why we're in the mess we're in. But we shouldn't discount those business people. And if one thinks about a modern business leader, I'm going to use Richard Branson as an example, but I mean, there's plenty of them out there. Um, you can fill in the names for me. You know, these people who lead companies like Google, um, okay. Facebook, etc. Okay. Yeah. So Richard Branson should be made an example of. So please go. <laughs> yes. Well, what do they really aspire to, the modern business leader? You know, they don't want more jewelry for their wife, do they? To be honest, they've got plenty for their own selves. I mean, in fact, phenomenal wealth that we've never experienced before. So much they can pay for the next 10 generations of their family. But, you know, this, I'm talking a modern business leader. Now, not the old monsters of the 19th century. What do they aspire to? They want to, yeah, they want to run a good business. They want to make lots of money. They want to have a great life. They want to take care of their family. They want to take care of their staff. They want to take care of their staff's family. They want to look after their customers. They want to do right by their community. They want to take care of the environment. They want to be socially responsible. They want to do good in the world. And hang on, wait a minute, this is our talk. This is hippie talk from, wait, what's happening? And of course, these people have got the power and the energy and the connections and the charisma to actually lead other people to do this. And I reckon this, the, the actual transition, um, I can talk about it so much more, Ben, uh, you know, we've, this is what we've been doing. We held this conference a month ago, which was just amazing, of uh, like-minded people to drive this forward. Fantastic, so exciting. I think what's going to happen ultimately is that somebody big is going to get this. Um, Page, I think his name is at Google, and he's going to say, all right, to hell with it. What's the reason I can't progress my business anymore is because no one's got any money. I do actually want to be the most successful businessman in the history of the planet. Yeah, okay, he's on a power trip and so on. That's fine. But man, he's got the charisma to carry it off. And his staff, when the time comes, when he says, okay, to hell with it, we're going to do the whole thing, Google for nothing. And okay, our fuel supply at the moment is mobile. We're going to say to mobile, hey, if you don't come on board, mate, we're going to shell. <laughs> and he's going to say to his construction firms and their transport companies and their electricity suppliers and their software producers and all their computer, you know, all the, all the people that are involved with Google, and you can imagine how many people that is now, 
this. They've got so much clout that he's going to be able to say, okay, we're going to do it without money. And if you don't want to do it, we'll get someone else because there's plenty of others clamoring out there who could do a better job and they'll do it for nothing. And suddenly the whole thing will just go, I believe the expression is a thunderclap, actually. Viral is too slow. <laughs> right around the world. Bang. People realize, oh my goodness. <laughs> Virgin are now the world's first moneyless airline. And if you don't want to be a supplier of aircraft, Mr. Boeing, to Virgin, then we're going to get Airbus. <laughs> No, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you talking about again? And, it, and the thing just goes, ripples right down to every single individual everywhere. Bang. And there you've got it, the world one transition. That's yeah. very interesting. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting <laughs> that a company would force its, its suppliers that way. Um, we'll see, I guess. I, I do agree with you that I think these things come in fits and starts and really, really... Yeah. Like, and actually, the word thunderclap is almost deliberate, I'd, I'd hope. Um, you've presumably heard of phone blocks, right? No. no. This. Basically, you know, at the moment, mobile phones are a welded shut unit. The maker movement has... Oh, has yes. Yes, no, my Dutch friends told me about it yesterday. Absolutely, like a Lego phone. Yep. Exactly, yes. So a mobile phone that works almost like Lego does with interchangeable yeah. for anybody yep. who doesn't understand. Yeah. And um, this thing went viral before they even released. So they have their... <laughs> they have their thoughts. And they had Thunderclap, which is the, the name of the viral platform that they used to try and do it. But it, it broke their servers like three days before they actually officially. <laughs> Fantastic. So, yeah. It has come. It's over, man. It's out yeah. there. And people yeah. know, know intuitively when they see it. They're like, yes, this is actually solving that yep. bug that I've had in yep. my mind every time I throw my old phone away. This yeah, is I hate it. Yes. Real yeah. problem is. And what was interesting there is that they had, as far as I understood, they had garnered the support of Motorola to produce some of these interchangeable parts because the whole thing about those interchangeable parts is that exactly that. They are interchangeable. They don't allow for the kind of uh, competitive, uh, you no. know, widget gain that, that is having the problem. It actually addresses a market function in that way. Um, yeah. The other thing I think of all the time these days is Bitcoin. As, as much of a... A uh, half solution and a non solution it is to the money yeah. problem. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> WikiLeaks donation blockade problem rather well because the very thing it isn't is controllable by governments or central banks or anything. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it is converted from and to Bitcoin back to dollars and, and pounds by the community, not by banks. And that's what. Right. Yeah. You can donate to WikiLeaks in a way that can't be blockaded by the powers that be. Again. Wow. It's it's not even a stopgap, but it's a no. reason uh, through technology something yeah. that is a real problem. So I do agree yeah. with you. these things when they happen they have automatic impetus behind them. They have automatic velocity. Yeah, without resistance. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. So listen yes. and tell me what the, the the next thing upcoming in your political efforts in Nelson. Um, what are they? When are they? And how can people help? Okay, yeah, the last one was Herbie. <laughs> Humanity Emerges Resource-Based Economy Conference, which we held at the Victory Community Center in Nelson uh, a couple of weeks ago, which was just amazing. I mean, we didn't have thousands of people, but thus we were able to focus really clearly on progressing the whole cause, and especially the concept of the cause, and to get some like-minded, I mean, we're talking some really smart people now, together and talk about nothing else for a whole weekend was absolutely phenomenal. Um, as regards the future, I need 500 uh, New Zealander signatures on a form that I've produced by the uh, end of June, to be able to register Money Free Party for the general election, which is in November. In theory, at the moment, the general election, <laughs> the timing of it is such that it's three months after the Prime Minister announces it, and that is as his wish. So we don't actually know precisely. If he announced it tomorrow, then we'd have a bit of a rush on our hands. But I've done most of the paperwork for the uh, registration application, and uh, I just need those 500 signatures. And I mean, I'm, I'm going to, into town today, actually. I'll be in town for a, this week because I live up in the mountains. But uh, there's nothing as exciting as walking around and saying to people, hey, would you mind putting a signature on this form? And they love it. You know, it's just it's a fabulous feeling, Ben, to know that, oh, wow, this is what people want, you know. And 500, I mean, I got 350 votes in Nelson alone and I need 500 signatures from anybody in New Zealand or anybody who is a, 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 a eligible to vote in New Zealand. Um, and really, 
we haven't got any... Oh, I beg your pardon. No, I've been invited to speak at a conference on 16th, 17th of April called Inspire. And it's uh, quite a long-running conference. It was originally uh, formed by the Ministry of Education, uh, but they ran out of funding, so it's now run by the Ministry of Inspiration, which is a sort of semi, semi-government semi department. <laughs> um, and they have about 500 gifted children from local schools of all ages attend this conference for two days um, with interesting speakers and workshops and programs. And my reputation preceded me, and I got an invitation letter last week to go and speak. I was three separate sessions at this conference, which is really exciting because talking to kids is just amazing. The kids get it straight away. And probably the best thing that has ever happened with resource-based economics, apart from my own sort of epiphany, is when I go to school groups and I sit there with 30 kids for an hour. We've got a 3D model, which I'll tell you about another time. And after that, I'd make a little presentation for about 15 minutes, and then I say to the kids, all right, why can't we do this? Because I need to know. This is important. Why can't we do this? And all the hands go up, and there's a few questions. But quite quickly, the other hands start going up to answer the questions. And that is just the most magical moment when I see a group of 30, 13, 14, 15-year-olds figuring out resource-based economics for themselves. And I mean, I just sit there and soak it up, man. It's amazing. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> it's exactly what Jim Phillips tells me as well, who does a lot of these school talks in the UK. And in fact, yeah. this I he's doing one of his school talks for us. So like, you can see what it's like, you know. And he says, man, like, the, the, the ones who ask the most important questions, in fact, it's the questions to which he finds he can't have find, find answers, are the yeah. kids. It's, the, it's the, the, the people like you and me, the adults, who ask the questions. Those questions are easily answerable because they tend to be you know, coming from the distorted lens of what it's like to live in our culture. Oh, we're all screwed up. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's just geniuses, and so and they ask the really difficult stuff. And he, he says, yeah. the time where he has to say, I don't know, I'll try and find out, is it. And, yeah. and that means that they are asking, they're really testing the idea out. They're pushing yes. it in all the yeah. directions, whereas we're trying to resist the part that the idea fills quite easily. Um, yeah. That kind of stuff I can, I can thoroughly understand. And I, can, I yeah. can agree with that. Yeah. Well, listen, yeah. I'm going to try and get, personally, uh, I'll try and get the, the word out to all of my New Zealand friends to, to get behind this. Because I mean, what would happen once you've got the 500 votes? What happens then? Okay, then I put that together with the application, which includes... Um, they're, it's, they're just statutory documents, basically, that one has to produce, and we have to show how we are forming a democratic party that has a, uh, uh, a mechanism, a visible mechanism of voting for candidates to show that we're doing it democratically. And I mean, that's just a paperwork exercise. You know, I've written a, a manual, basically, of rules as to how the party will operate. I mean, ours is no different to the National Party or the Labour Party. You know, this is just how, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know, if you're on a village hall committee, you know, somebody keeps the minutes. Um, if you have a resolution to discuss, then you have a vote for it and a second and all that kind of thing, and you write it all down, and you just make sure you keep proper records. You know, it's just about being businesslike, which, with the greatest respect, to the hippie community, I mean, we haven't been that businesslike in the past, you know. If you want to play at the big table, then you're going to have to do some things properly. And, you know, just sitting around in pubs with pipes and bitter, it's not enough. You know, you've got to put a suit on and go to the meeting, you know, and write some things down and sort of be grown up about it, you know. All right, fantastic. And uh, is there any chance that you'll ever come and visit us back in Blighty again and reunite yourself with your your Sussex roots, by the way, my family lives very close to uh, West Sussex as well. So, oh, do they? <laughs> yeah, we we come from we hail from a very similar area. So I, I know the kind of the land the landscape you're invoking when you think of your early years and your especially your farming. I can, I can oh, okay, it. yeah, Horsham was n our nearest town. Well, yes, okay, very close to Christ Hospital School. Then. Oh wow, yeah, yeah, very close. Yeah, yeah, we used to go and play sport at Christ Hospital. I was at the Weald School at Billingshurst. Yeah. Uh, Fantastic. But uh, do you do you ever come over and visit? Oh uh, well, we've been here ten years. I mean, we've probably been over twenty times, particularly when my parents were in less good health and sort of, you know during their demise. Um, but we've I mean I've run out of money to be honest, Ben. <laughs> right. 
fair enough, it's man. Very you've got, you've got the right side of the world. So <laughs> it's like you, you didn't run out of money when you were in the UK and stuck here. So. Oh no, no, we we had plenty then, <laughs> yeah, but it's all gone now. And you know, as you'll know, you know, separation doesn't help. It doesn't come cheap. And yeah, that sort of changes one's plans a bit. And I mean, one thing I'm determined to do now, having retired at 40, is never go back to work. <laughs> no way. I mean, it's famous last words. We have a palatial existence, really. I mean, we, we scrimp and save and, you know, we drive old bangers with bald tyres and you know, <laughs> we eat like mice. But uh, we have a fabulous life. And, of course, the best part about it is I'm free to pursue whatever my, you know, whatever I'm interested in. And, you know, when, as I found when, when my parents were suffering, and I mean, fortunately, I did get to go and visit them a lot, but I couldn't be with them all the time. You know, I just have that kind of conscience. If others aren't thriving then i can't thrive either my thanks again to richard for coming on the show and i of course wish him all the best if you're a new zealander and you feel like casting a vote uh, or two his way i do recommend it i mean it's only 500 that he needs for his next process and that's about it from me uh, we will see all those who are coming to our particular zeitgeist days on the day and we're looking very much forward to seeing you and talking with you and until then, uh, I will uh, wish you all the best with your events worldwide and all the best with everything else that's going on. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.